Well, this morning, let's continue the Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew chapter 6. And this morning, we're going to be looking at, um, what is it, verses 16. Um, that's interesting. Okay, 16 through, um, uh, what am I? I missed up here. Okay, 19 through 24. <laughs> okay. But I think what I'd like to do, I forget whether I, I mentioned this to the crew upstairs, but if I could read through the end of the chapter. Is that, um, is that what we have planned? Okay, let's do that. All right, so Jesus begins in verse 19 by saying this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory, uh, not even Solomon in all his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace... Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 24. I believe in both instances our Lord Jesus is telling us that we need to seek first his kingdom. In the first section it tells us that if we do that, we'll be storing up treasures in heaven. It tells us in the second section if we do that, the Lord will take care of our needs on earth. Now, we're going to look just at the first section this morning. Uh, just by way of reminder, last week we saw Jesus um, speaking about three things that he wants us to do as we serve him in this world. He wants us to show his compassion to the poor, to pray for his kingdom and our needs, and to fast so that the Lord might actually speed these things along. But he also warned us about how we are to do these things. Remember, we are not to do them publicly so that everyone can see us, so that everyone can applaud us and think how good we are, how pious we are, how holy we are. Because if that's what we really want, Jesus says that that is all we're really going to get. Instead, Jesus says that we should do these things privately so that only the Father sees these things, so that only he is honored by these things. And Jesus tells us that if we do, that the Father will see these things that we do in secret. Don't be afraid that nobody's watching. I mean, God is watching. The Father's watching. And what he sees done in secret, he will reward openly. Now, notice, first of all, Jesus there is talking about a reward. There is a reward for doing the things that the Lord calls us to do that advance the kingdom. Now, this morning, Jesus follows up on, I believe, that particular point of the reward. And he's answering this question. Why should we rather have that that the Father has to give us rather than what we can get from others while we're here? Well, Jesus actually gives us three reasons why the reward that he gives us is superior 
and of course the desire for that reward is superior than what we might be able to gain here. And I believe we should pay close attention to what Jesus actually says here because what he's actually doing is giving to us another diagnostic tool by which we can tell what the condition of our hearts actually is. Remember, Jesus was speaking to his disciples, but they weren't the only ones who were there. There were also uh, the crowd that had gathered because they had seen his miracles. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples, but he's also speaking past them to the crowds. These are things that both need to hear, but particularly the crowd, because they haven't yet made that, as it were, commitment to the Lord Jesus. So why should we want what the Father has to give? Why should we want the blessings of his kingdom? Why should we want to advance the kingdom, his kingdom in this world, rather than our own kingdom in this world for our own benefit? Well, again, Jesus gives us three reasons. The first one is because the things that he will give us are going to last a whole lot longer than the things that we might gain in this world. Secondly, because if we really want those things that are in heaven, if that's where our treasure is, our hearts will be constantly moving us in that direction, and that is the direction we want to go. By the way, unless the, our treasure is in heaven, we're not going to go that direction. If it's on earth, we're going to go that direction instead. And then thirdly, the third reason is because if we really don't want the things that are above, Jesus says there is something terribly wrong with our hearts that need to be corrected. So first of all, let's look at the first reason. Why should we want what the Father has to give us? The first reason is because what He gives us will last much longer than what we might gain in this world. Now Jesus begins by telling us something that we should know very well by now, and that is that we shouldn't desire the things of this world, even the things that are, that are so-called good, even the things that are lawful, even the things that we can have in this world without sinning, because they're only temporary. I think we understand these things are temporary. He says in verse 19, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Jesus is telling us that anything that we might possibly acquire here, anything that we could possibly gain, one day we will have to lose. It's either going to fall apart in our hands, decay and turn into dust, or it's going to be taken away from us in one way or another. I mean, think about the things of this world. There's really nothing that will last forever. The nicest house that we could possibly ever have is one day going to get old and decay and be condemned and demolished. Now, there are some structures that have lasted quite a long time, but even they are eventually going to turn back into dust. The most expensive car that we could possibly drive, the fastest, most luxurious, if you, you know, there are programs on television that actually sort of showcase all these things and, you know, have the tendency to make us want those things. No matter how nice that car is, eventually, it's going to grow old, it's going to rust, and it's going to be sent to the wrecking yard to be scrapped. It doesn't matter what it is. I remember um, Bob Needham, oh, you know Bob Needham well, he um, uh, had collected all these Packards. You know, Packards, they stopped building Packards a long time ago. And he had virtually his own wrecking yard in, in his backyard of all these cars, but one of his neighbors complained. You know, he was trying to save these cars for parts for people who had Packards. But one of his neighbors complained and said, we don't like this scrapyard that's next to our house, and so he needs to get rid of these things. And so he had to try to use the parts that he could, try to send them out wherever he could send them. And then, very sadly, he had to call the wrecking crew to come out and take a bunch of them and, and, and wreck them. Eventually, every, every precious vehicle is going to be scrapped. The nicest clothes that we could ever possibly own in time are either going to wear out or literally be eaten by moths. By the way, you should look online to see what moths like to eat. They, they'll eat virtually anything. Whatever position we might have in our vocations one day, we're going to have to leave that position. Whatever fame we gain in this world will eventually be eclipsed. And by the way, there's no guarantee we're going to actually gain these things. But even if we do have them, we'll eventually lose them. And even if we did something so remarkable 
as few in the history of this world actually have, we will eventually be forgotten. All the money and the things we could possibly own can be stolen. And even if somehow we manage to hold on to what we have throughout our entire lives, you know that eventually we're going to have to leave it all behind when we leave this world to give an account to God of how we actually use the things that he gave to us. This is what Jesus had in mind, the warning against this kind of thinking, when he told his disciples this parable to warn them against greed. We read in Luke 12, verses 16 through 21, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. See, this is kind of a summary of everything Jesus is saying here. What good is it to amass all this treasure? What should the, this farmer have done? Instead of building larger barns, perhaps he should have taken some of that food and given it to somebody who was in need. Then he would have treasure in heaven. But instead, he didn't. He kept it all. God took it all away from him. He's going to give it to somebody else. And now he has to answer for the things that he has done. It's not wise to store up treasures on earth. We need to store them up in heaven. And that's what Jesus tells us to do in verse 20. He says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. Instead of pursuing the things of this world, we should instead focus on the things that are above, the things that don't decay, the things that nobody can actually take away from us. Now, are there such things as this? Well, of course there are. Remember what Jesus told the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, verse 21. He says, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Jesus told the rich young ruler he could actually transfer his possessions that were on earth to heaven by giving them to people who are in need. Giving in need, this is what we looked at last week, is one of the ways that we gain these treasures. Solomon writes in Proverbs 19, verse 17, one who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. The Bible says that he actually repays us in this life with more so that we can have our needs met and, and give more, and he will reward us also in heaven. <clears throat> Whatever we give, by way of time, talents, resources, whatever we do, for the Father's honor, he says he will reward. That's really what Paul's telling us in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 8 through 15, which is a text we usually turn to when we want to see not only that there is treasure or reward, but that there are varying degrees. Some get more, some get less, some get none. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 8 through 15, Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, 
he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, what is Paul talking about here? Well, first of all, he's talking about the work of the gospel ministry. Paul was one of those who planted. He was one of those who laid the foundation of Jesus Christ in the lives of others by preaching the gospel and, of course, the Lord working along with him to save them. And then after he planted a church, others would come along and they would water what it is he planted. They labored in the church, building on the foundation that he laid. And Paul says each would receive a reward based upon the work that they actually did. Now, that doesn't just apply to them. It also applies to everyone. And we have numerous passages through Scripture, not the least of which the one we're looking at this morning that each of us is going to be rewarded based upon our works. Now, we also have a work to do for the Lord in His kingdom. We have the same foundation laid in our lives, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. We're also building on that foundation by the things that we do. One day, we're going to have to stand before the Lord, and He's going to examine what it is we've actually built on that foundation by putting the fire to it to see if there's anything that will remain after the work is burned up. That which remains are the things that we did for Him, genuinely for Him and for His kingdom. Now, whatever remains, He'll give us a reward for it. And again, I should mention here that these rewards are really not earned by us. They're actually gifts of grace. We don't really deserve them, but God says He will reward us for these things. And those rewards are based upon His fulfilling His promise. But notice Paul says, if everything is burned up, if we were so torn between the Lord's kingdom and the world that we ended up basically doing nothing of any real value for God, he says we still will be saved because of what Jesus did, because of his sacrifice, because of his righteousness, even though we will not receive any reward. We'll suffer loss, but we will still be saved. Now again, Jesus is talking here about rewards, rewards the Father graciously gives for the things that we do. He's not talking about how we enter into heaven. We can enter into heaven only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by trusting in Him alone for our salvation, turning from our sins and walking with Him and following Him. That's not what Jesus has in mind here. What He has in mind are rewards. So, first reason why we should store up our treasures in heaven, why we should be laboring to advance the kingdom of heaven here rather than our own kingdom is because we'll be storing up treasures in heaven where we'll get to keep them forever instead of storing them on earth where eventually they're all going to be taken away from us. Okay? Now, the second reason Jesus gives us as to why we should store up treasure in heaven is this, in verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is telling us, again, what we already know. Our hearts always move us in the direction of the things that we value the most. If we value the things of the world, if that's what we love, if that's what we treasure, that's the direction we're going to go. But if we treasure the things that are in heaven, then that is the direction that we'll be headed. In other words, working to advance the kingdom of heaven rather than our own kingdom. Now, we need to ask ourselves this question. Which direction are we going? Are we going forward in the kingdom of heaven? Or are we trying to forward our kingdom on earth? Maybe we should think about, again, not just the eternality or how long these things will actually last, which is what Jesus talked about in the first place. Maybe we need to think about what it is that's in heaven that we should actually desire to see if it's it's really something we want. Maybe if we're not going the right direction or as strongly as we should, maybe we don't really understand what is there. Now, what is in heaven? What are these rewards? We haven't actually talked about that yet. Well, I'll tell you one thing. They are not what the health and wealth gurus tell us they are, which is often, you know, rich mansions that are lavishly decorated and and big, right? 
They take that passage where Jesus says, I, there's, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So that Jesus is building my mansion, and the more you do, the more materials get sent up, the bigger your mansion gets, and, and so forth, and streets of gold, and all these things that we think are precious here. That's not the rewards that Jesus is referring to here. Actually, what he's talking about is much more valuable than anything that's in this world that eventually is going to perish. Now, what is it that we will actually get to enjoy there? Well, there's some things that we all get to enjoy. Perfection, for one thing. And if you love the Lord, that's what you want to be. Perfect like Jesus. No more desire for sin and only perfect love in our hearts. Loving God and loving the saints and the angels. That's a great blessing. Being free from sickness and death. No more suffering, no more tears. No more death and dying. No more worrying about where our next meal is going to come from, although Jesus is going to tell us in the next section you never have to worry about that anyway. All your needs fully met. No discomfort, no lack, no, you know, again, desire for something, wish things were different. It's all perfect. There we get to enjoy perfect fellowship with one another and with the angels. We get to see God with our eyes and experience his love in its fullness. Again, we have a down payment of that. We get a taste of that on earth, but we don't have the full ex experience. We won't get it until then. But we also have these added blessings of the rewards that God tells us that he will give us for our service. Well, what are those rewards? I mean, what could be greater than the things I've already mentioned? And we already know the things of the world essentially are worthless. So what is it that he's going to give us? What, what is it that the gold and the precious stones and the jewels or whatever, what does that actually represent? Well, there's really only two things that some people will get more than others in heaven as we think about the varying degrees of reward based upon what we do because not everybody is going to get the same thing, right? Uh, some are going to have their works burned. Others are going to have things that remain. Some are going to get a reward. Some aren't going to get a reward. Those who get a reward, there's going to be varying degrees of reward. So what are the things he's actually going to give us? Well, again, there's only two things. Honor and the capacity to enjoy what we already have more than we might otherwise. Now, Peter talks about this honor as a crown of glory. The Bible says that there are places of honor in heaven. There was one occasion, remember, where James and John, their, their mother, came up to Jesus, and they said, uh, Jesus, I, I want something from you. He says, what do you want? He goes, she goes, in your kingdom, can my two sons sit one on your right hand and one on your left? You don't know what you're asking. Are, are they able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And, and they said, we're able. And he says, okay, well, then you will drink that cup. But to give you these places of honor is not mine to give. Rather, it is for those whom the Father has appointed. There are these places of honor that, that the mother, who, as, as most mothers do, want honor for their children. She asked Jesus for this. She understood that there were places of honor. Uh, Jesus said, he didn't deny that there were, but said that there were, but they were only for those whom the Father had prepared. There are honors in heaven, places of honor, differing seats, within the kingdom of heaven. But there are also degrees of blessedness. And I think we can only really see it in this way, that not every believer is going to enjoy heaven in exactly the same way. There are going to be those who will be able to enjoy it more, though everyone will enjoy it fully. No one's going to sense any lack, but some are going to have more fullness of blessing and be able to enjoy all the things we've talked about more than others. Now again, the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is this, whether these things actually appeal to us, whether we want them badly enough to part with whatever it is we might think, well, whatever it is we might gain here in order to have it. You know, Jesus actually tells us that we must be willing to part with everything if we are to have these things. But again, it's not in exactly the same sense as the rich young ruler, but in a very real sense, like the rich young ruler. Remember, Jesus said, no one can be my disciple unless he gives up all his own possessions, unless he picks up his cross, dies to himself, 
and follows me. That's what the Lord calls us to do, to, to put our lives aside and to basically follow Him, to do what it is that He wants us to do rather than what we want to do. We need to be willing to give up our possessions, even as He said to the rich young ruler. Do you realize the apostles or the disciples, the twelve, turned to Him after Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler and, and He said, we've left everything to follow you. We've done what you told this guy to do. So what is there going to be in it for us? What are we going to get? He says, in the regeneration, you will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And we realize Judas was among them. He was certainly not going to sit on one of those thrones. Jesus said it was better for that man that he had never been born. But rather, he was talking, I think, about Paul, who was going to take his place. And they would sit on these 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. They would have places of honor. Jesus tells us we have to be willing to die to ourselves, give up our lives. We have to be willing to give up our possessions, which means essentially to do with what we have, whatever the Lord would have us to do as his stewards, if we are to possess the kingdom of heaven. Jesus represents this in two parables in, in Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. See, in both cases, the kingdom of heaven is a treasure. It was worth everything they had. And they, dipped, they were willing to let it all go so they might have it. Now, that is essentially what Jesus is telling us. The kingdom of heaven must be so precious to us that we are willing to let everything and anything go that he wants us to let go to possess it or in our service to the kingdom to give to him. It doesn't mean we liquidate everything and get rid of it because then we become charity cases for somebody else. But we have to be willing to do with what, what, it, uh, with what we have what the Lord wants us to do with it. So again... Second reason why we should store up our treasures, why they should be our treasures in heaven is because that's where our heart is going to be, whatever we value the most. You know, whenever we love something more than God, that becomes an idol. That has to go. We have to love God and his kingdom most of all. But finally, Jesus gives us a couple of warnings. What if we don't treasure those things more? What if we don't want them? Well, then there's something wrong with our hearts, something terribly wrong. Now, he gives us two warnings. The first one has to do with our eyes. The second one has to do with who is our master. Now, first Jesus says in verses 22 and 23, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is is the darkness. Now, what does Jesus mean by this? Well, he's drawing an analogy between our desires and our eyes. Because, likely, I think, because our desires actually grow out of what our eyes see. We usually desire what we see. That's the way it comes in our senses. Although people who can't see also desire things. It's not purely through our eyes, but for us, mainly it is. Now, Jesus says that if the eye is clear, that is, if the eye is healthy, it lets <clears throat> light into the body. You're able to see. Your whole body is full of light. But if it's bad, if it's diseased, if it doesn't let light in, all you have is essentially darkness. Now, what Jesus is doing is drawing an analogy between healthy and sick eyes physically and spiritually. He says the same thing is true in the spiritual realm. If our eye is healthy, that is, if it's fixed on heaven and the treasures that are actually in heaven, then we, our whole body is full of light. I mean, essentially, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have the light of God, and we're walking in the light, and we have the, the light of the hope that one day we're actually going to be with Him, and we're going to enjoy these things. But if it's diseased, if it's fixed on the things of the world and desires the things of the world and not the things that are above, then we are full of darkness, the darkness of sin. And ultimately, we're going to be destroyed. That's, that's a big problem. So what condition 
are your eyes in? Jesus is asking us, what is it that we're looking at? Jesus' second warning has to do with the danger of not having a single heart. He says in verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now, what he's telling us here is that we cannot have two things controlling our hearts. We can't pursue the things above and the things that are in the world because they're going to get in each other's way. Now, again, think about the rich young ruler. Why was it that he could not give up? Basically, why couldn't he follow Jesus? It's because something else had hold of his heart. He had another master, and that master was his riches. And because of that, he despised Jesus, and he left. He couldn't let go of his wealth. His heart was bound. Now, that reminds us that these things really are issues of the heart. If our hearts are renewed by God's Holy Spirit, then we will serve God as our master. And as we're serving him, we will have our eyes focused on heaven. And really, we'll find that the things of the world will essentially get in our way. And so, we will despise the things of the world. But if our souls have not been renewed by the Holy Spirit, we're going to be serving ourselves. We're going to be serving the world. We're going to be serving wealth. We're going to have our eyes focused on this world, and we're going to find that the things of God just get in the way. And so we're going to resent them. You, you can't serve two masters. You, you're going to hold to just one of them. You're going to devote yourself to just one of them. And the other one you're going to despise. Now, Jesus tells us that if we fall in the latter category, diseased eyes and uh, serving the, you know, basically wealth rather than serving God, that we have a serious problem. That our hearts are still full of darkness and our future is bleak. Now, what can we do about that if that's the situation that we find ourselves in? Well, again, going back to what Jesus said to his disciples, we cannot do anything. Remember, Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to go, through, or actually it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. Well, then who can be saved? Jesus said, with men, it is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. We can't do anything about it. We can't save ourselves, but God can. God has done something about it. God sent his son into the world so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. And he promises that he will save us if we come to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're fixed on the world, if you're serving that as your master, you need to repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to come to him. He's the only one who can give you the power to break free from the other master. He's the only one who can give you a love for the things above. Now, what about those of us who already want the things of heaven, who already have our treasures there, our heart is there, our eyes are fixed there, we're serving the Lord as our master, but we're tempted by the things of the world. What do we do then? Well, realize that's a part of the Christian life. That's something we are going to have to endure, but the Lord has fortified us against those temptations. We need to remember what Jesus told us earlier. Whatever we might you know, gain from the world, we're not going to be able to keep except the things that we do for him and the things that we give to him. Jesus would have us consider the long term. You know, look at the long road. Look at, don't just consider the short term and what you can get here. Life is short. It's, it's very short. James tells us in James 4 verse 14, you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Peter, re reflecting on the same thing, basically says, you're, you know, we're, we're like the, the grass of the field. And, you know, it, the grass gets this little flower on it and it flowers in the morning. Toward evening it withers away and that's what we're like. We're, we're just here for a very brief time. But the life that goes on after this life, the one in heaven, stretches on forever. That's why Edwards reminds us of something which is a very basic principle that we ought to live by. 
And he said this, it doesn't really matter who prospers here below. For this brief period of time, for this moment in eternity, I mean, how long are we going to live? 70, 80, 90, 100 years? What is that in light of eternity? It doesn't matter who prospers here. What matters is who prospers in the eternal state. You see, that goes on quite a bit longer than here. So Jesus is telling us that we need to live today in such a way that our eternity will be full. Don't try to fill up this moment of time with all the fun and pleasures that you can possibly pack into it or the things of this world. But instead, as a wise steward, use what the Lord has given to you in this world to store up treasures in heaven where you'll get to enjoy them forever. Well, may the Lord give us wisdom to do that. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to do just that.